This talk is about a universal solution. How many of you believe we have a universal solution? <laughs> Some of you? No? OK. So very interesting. You're, like, you, you're laughing. OK, no, OK. All right. How many of you have heard about deep learning? Or you haven't heard about deep learning? Haven't heard about deep learning? Yeah, haven't. Everybody. OK, very good. So, so many successful stories, huh? So it seems like we're very close to, we're very, very close to a universal solution, solution and you just uh, simply apply deep learning, huh? But uh, is this true? So we will see, huh? This is a group of uh, some photo we took like maybe 2016. Half of them graduated and uh, they left, but I also have new students coming in. So it's a very uh, mixed group. We have people from Europe, from the United States, from Asia, and all, almost all over the world. Huh? So I mention this because the work I, I'm able to present here mainly due to my students' work. Okay. Without them, I won't be able to talk. That's the good thing about the professors, right? Professor talk and students work. <laughs> All right. And but I was a student before, so take turns, huh? So and big data and deep learning. And we have seen the surge of big data. Okay. So I still remember. 1995, the very first KDD was held also in Canada. But that's, uh, that's a less remote place than this place. It's Montreal, okay? And so when I met my old friends that, that time, we felt always lucky we chose either AI or data mining, you see? So it goes stronger and stronger, right? So AI and data mining. You can see so many people attending the conference. So the key here is the success of KDD shows that raw oil can be turned into valuable products. People have seen the values. That's why so many industrial uh, participants here, right? They find there are ways, now we have ways to turn data into something valuable. The title is about big data and deep learning, right? So I put a question mark there. At the end of this talk, we still have to confirm or refute, right? So we have to make the question mark disappear. All right, yes or no? So what do you think? What's the, how many of you took AI course, a logic course? Half of you, okay, very good. So what do we need to do? If we just, we want to refute it, we just need to make one of the terms disappear or we say this is not true, then the equation goes away, right? All right, let's see if we can do that. But if we want to prove that this equation actually is true, it would be very, very difficult. Okay? That's why I asked about uh, the AI training, okay? But it's okay. Huh? We still can discuss, like, after I present my arguments, and you will see if you are convinced or not. So, deep learning basically revived neural networks. I first the time when I was a student, that was 1980, around the 80, late 80s. Two famous books, two cop, two volumes of the famous books related to neural networks are called. Anybody here? Very young, huh? PDP books. Yeah. Wow! Finally, PDP books. Okay, that's the second wave of neural networks. This is the third wave, okay? This is the third wave. I published my very first paper at first 
IJCNN. Okay, this is the one formulation. Yes, if it's if we had a sufficiently big data, okay, we just assume deep learning is so powerful, okay? It is so powerful; it can solve everything you want. Although that's not true, but uh, let's assume this. So then we only need to consider the big data part, right? We will see the big data is big or not. So it, it would be true if we had a sufficient tree, big data. But do we ha often have enough data? What do you think? How many of you actually have worked on data mining? All of you, very good. Do you have too much data or you have usually have too little data? Too little, yes, always, right? So if you have really sufficient amount of data, what happens? You don't need any machine learning, right? Just table lockup. Have you really learned machine learning algorithms? Right? If you have a lot of data, OK, it's sufficient to cover your search space, then it's just table lockup. You don't need anything else. But you can also argue about like it's lazy learning, it's too slow. You see all of these things, huh? But often we don't have enough data. So I hope you agree with me. Social media data is obviously big. Agree? This is a very important assumption, okay? Social media data is big. Okay, now we agree on this. So we will use social media data as an example in this argument, in this discussion, okay? So I start with the big data. How, how big it is? It's this big. How many, of, how, how, how many of you have never used the social media? Everybody, huh? So, okay, so you agree we have a lot of data. And a key to success in search of a universal solution, remember, it is we have enough data. So we already have big data, social media data. How can we make it bigger? But the argument is, do we need to make it bigger? And we will see. Making big data bigger. What is big data? Have you heard about the definition of big data? No? Yes? Some of you, most of you? They usually say four Vs, right? Whatever, huh? We just say four Vs, five Vs. Uh, some people try to be innovative. They have five Vs, six Vs. Actually, they don't know this is delta. So four Vs are always people remember. You can always add N Vs after four Vs. And that's the conventional answer. So a practitioner's answer is more nuanced because it seems like we have big data, we don't have enough data, so how can we say we have big data? If data is not enough, well, what do you mean by big? Okay, so the argument here is big data can be actually little or thin. A little or thin, big data can be actually little or thing. For machine learning or data mining, we know now, the more data, the better, right? The more data, the better. So in this uh, discussion, I'm going to talk about how to make little data bigger and how to make thin data thicker. So based the assumption that social media data is bigger, huh? social media data is big. But now, we have this curse of dimensionality. I have to introduce the curse of dimensionality that then you will appreciate what is, uh, why pr practitioner's view is nuanced, okay? So data sparsity becomes exponentially worse as feature dimensionality increases. That's basically summarizes curse of dimensionality. The more features you have, you need exponentially more data for your training, okay? So this is an example. We also presented this in the tutorial yesterday. 
And one dimension, we have three intervals. Okay, so we have three intervals for x1, and we have nine data points. But now, still nine data points. We have, Charles, we have a, we have a, we have a seat reserved for you. And we have, when it's 2D, then look, how many units I have, it, it becomes nine units from three to nine. So now every unit I, on average I have one data point. But if I increase it to 3D, then I have 27 units. So now each unit does not even have one data point. Do you see the problem here? But this is more like, um, more theoretical. So I don't want to get involved in this, but this is more like uh, tangible. All right, so first, uh, like uh, curse of dimensionality. With the curse of dimensionality, we would understand what is the, why big data sometimes, it is not big at all. Uh, relevant to redundant and irrelevant features. So in this case, I just quickly go through this. This is a relevant feature, feature one. Given feature one, then feature two is redundant. So I don't need to really feature two. I can do the classification. It's a classification problem. You have two classes here. But then F3 is irrelevant. Do you see this? F3 is irrelevant. So now I quickly just introduce uh, relevant, redundant, and irrelevant features. Then the feature selection. I try to yeah, give you a quick definition of feature selection. Basically, it tries to find relevant or salient features for your application. So the key, one key feature of data mining is that people collect the data for you. And they ask you to find things for them. But when you collect the data, you actually have no idea what it is for. You just try to collect as much as you can. But when for you to have a, to work on a problem, you just get the data and work on it, right? So very likely you will need feature selection to help you to find relevant features. In this case, I have five instances or data points. We have 10 features. Okay, but then actually we just say we have the crystal ball. We know which features are, uh, are relevant for this particular application. We have three features that are relevant. So after we select the features in ideal circumstances, then we will be able to get data like this. So feature selection can make data bigger now. How big it is. Why we say a per practitioner's view of big data is more nuanced. This is the case. Remember this example? So I have five, feature, uh, five, uh, five data points and 10 features. And in this case, if it's binary value, then I will have this percentage of data. Okay, because I only have five data points. But the, the, the total instance space, data point space is to the power of 10, all right? And that's before feature selection. After feature selection, I only select the three features. And then what do I have suddenly? I have like a five out of eight now. Total search space is eight, I have five. So it's more than 50%. This one is less than 1%, right? In this case. So just so you can, you can just amplify the da this data five, you consider this five data instances, so you can, you can multiply this by say billions. Then it can be like, a, of course, you do billions here, you times billions there too, right? So when you do this, you think you have big data, but actually you don't have big data. You don't have a lot of data, okay? This is the case. So does the F feature selection always work? Yes, for most high-dimensional data. Yesterday in the tutorial, Jing Dong 
and I, we, and also Ji Liang Tang, three of us give a tutorial. We tried to convince the audience. We had like more than 150 participants yesterday. So we show them whoop, this is the case. Then now, where can we find it? Albert mentioned about the scikit feature. Have you heard about the scikit learn? Yes, great. And Albert told me that the scikit learn actually originated from France. I don't know, I, because he is now in France, probably he's biased. Huh? <laughs> and so, but I think a lot of people are using scikit learn. So we just uh, build um, the scikit feature uh, around uh, scikit learn. Okay, Jing Dong is the guy who is in charge of this. Uh, it says uh, five machine learning, I think in April, KDD, if you didn't see this, like uh, Gregory's uh, newsletter, and it says uh, five machine learning products you can no longer overlook. Some blogger quoted uh, our scikit feature, say basically it's a very convenient uh, uh, feature selection tool you can use. Okay, now back to, how can we make a big data bigger, okay? So most people, like many of us, are in the long tail. Do you agree? The data about us, like a data about you, and the, your friends, and the posts you make, and the noise you make, whatever you do. Like if you think you are, you tweet every second, or if you think you can post every hour, and still you don't have a lot of data, okay? This is the key, like uh, most of us are here. Most of us. And what's the point? Our data is often thin or sparse, that's number one. Number two, if you are from the company, any from industry, what do you think? Which group of people you want to make money out of? Do we have people from companies? So they will tell you they want to make money out of sh short head or long tail. I don't hear anything. I think, did you have enough coffee or something? <laughs> so quiet. Okay, so. What are the short heads here in social media? Celebrities. Used to be Obama also, right? And now Trump, uh, okay? So also you have these uh, Hollywood movie stars and all of this. Easily they have like a lot of followers. They are the short heads. Do you think your company care about them? Your company give money to them. Right? So they want to, the companies actually want to make money out of people like you and me. People in the long tail. So when we need the money, actually, we do, oh, not money, everybody needs money. When we need the data, everybody needs data too, and we don't have data, right? Agree? Unless you think you have a lot of data, okay? But then you please tell us, huh? then we will buy data from you, okay? Especially Albert has a lot of money. <laughs> okay. And uh, with little data, machine learning is powerless. Okay, we don't, I don't want to, like, uh, even for deep learning, okay? Because with little data, it's very easy for them to overfit. When they overfit the little data, then they won't be able to generalize. Okay, well, for unseen data. Social media data offers uh, new opportunities. So multiple facets. Social media data, like a posts, a profile, linked information, and multiple platforms that offer different functions. I already showed you Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and a lot, of, lot more, okay? And I will use two cases to show you how can we use social network information to make thin data thicker and the little data bigger. Okay, so just uh, try to be critical, okay? You said, how can we do that? Nothing can be out of the blue, right? So do I have anything magical? Let's see. Huh? Use link information for data thickening. So where 
can we find additional information for feature selection? I just use social media data, then use feature selection as a concrete example to show you how to do it, right? I need some concrete example. So social media data contains various types of data, and linked information is sort of like additional, like in terms of the conventional data. Usually we have attribute value data, okay? But in other sources also we can have like a sentiment, likes, and whatever you can find. So as a matter of fact, there are some theories we can use, borrow from social science and to guide us to use social, uh, linked information. So then the issue here is extract distinct relations from linked data for feature selection. So I give you a uh, uh, graphic description of the data, okay? So usually if you do feature selection, you have features and they have classes, then these are the data points, right? And then for social media data, we have uh, additional layers of information. So here is like uh, posts are written by some users. So user one wrote P1 and P2, for example. And a and user and the user, they follow each other. So they have this user-user relation. Right? But of course, you have more. They, you comment on the features, uh, you comment on the posts, and you like, you sum up, or sometimes you can do all kinds of things, right? But here, we call this social context. When we have this kind of information, so we need to, like, this is, uh, Graph view. So now you have data point, uh, users. User writes their posts, and the user follow each other. Okay. Sometimes they follow each other. Sometimes because U four, you see, he only follows U two, and U one, U three actually follow U four. Okay. So we have co-post, co-following, co-followed, and following. So then, in this case, you see. When we try to make use of, we assume we don't have a lot of data, right? Okay, but then we use this network information. Then we will see here, I want to use this to explain, show you the performance I show you. And for the data set, we only use, this one is, uh, okay, so for data mining, right? You use the training data and test the data. So for this case, we say we only use 5%, 5% of the training data. We keep the test data intact, okay? So then we can do the comparison, right? So training test. I only use 5%, 5% of the training data. This is 100% uh, of the training data. So use 5% of training data. These are the standard feature selection algorithms. You can find in the feature, uh, scikit feature, feature package. And then these are the different like uh, relationships individually, okay? So in this case, we only need 5% of the data, training data, with additional linked information. We get this kind of a performance, okay? This is a... Uh, Supervised learning, so you can do the tenfold cross validation to verify the performance accuracy. But then it's like a similar to as if you use 100 percent of the training data. Okay, here the performance is similar, right? Do you see this? So it's interesting, huh? So I only use five percent of labeled data plus the additional network information, I can do as well as if you don't use the network information, but you just use all the training data. We know this labeling data costs, right? And even though you can use uh, Amazon Mechanical Turks, but uh, still there are some issues, right? So the point here is I want to show you that we can make uh, thing that are thicker. So basically we add another layer of the data so we can make data bigger. 
we can do the same task, but we do better, okay? This is the case. There's unlabeled information, but I don't need to include in my discussion here. So, because unlabeled usually is more common, and labeled data is more, it's better for learning, but it's more costly to get. Now, two cases, right? It is how to gather more data with little data. I don't have very little data. How can I get more data? Collectively, social media data is indeed big. I already mentioned all of these, right? So you already agree for the people in the long tail, and we don't have enough data. So when big social media data isn't big, what should we do? We need to start with the little data to make, uh, to gather more data. How can we do that? So the key here is to use different uh, social media services, like different uh, platforms of the data. So for example, I will give you an example later. And if you are active on one side, you are also on other sites, then if there's a way to connect to you, then we have more data about you, right? So gather more data with little data. Collectively, uh, this is the, for example, we have LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of these, this kind of a data. So we have an example here. Huh? Little data about an individual but many social media sites. Each site has partial information. You, I mean, you sign up on different sites because they offer different services, right? So then, you, of course, you have redundant information, but you also have complementary information to be collected. So if we can uh, collect all the information, then we will be able to uh, make the user profile better. Okay, so this is the case. The first author of this uh, 2013 KDD paper. So he is now uh, an assistant professor at uh, Syracuse University. So it's a LinkedIn case. So we also have the Twitter case. So do you see? For, for this case, there is no image. But for this case, we have image. And this is Tempe. This is like a Phoenix. And then this, you have a year. So the, in this case, you can see different sites can provide the different uh, complementary information. So this enables us to, if we can, gather the data, then we will be able to get more data. So search for more data with little data. So each social media site can have varied amount, and which information definitely exists for all sites. We, we already said, right? We say, hey, we have little data. We cannot assume we have a lot more data. So which site, uh, which information we, should, we have? We definitely have for every site. What do you think? Yeah. Username, right? OK, everybody has a username. But probably you will use different usernames. If you are very self-conscious. Yes, please. You have a question? No. Oh, so you raise your hand. It seems. OK. I can use different usernames for different Pardon me? I can use different usernames for different Yes, yes, very good. That's the key, right? You can use different usernames. Absolutely. You think you can use different usernames. There is no way to like, uh, capture them, for example. But uh, this is the work. A user, you, a user's usernames on different sites can be different. We agree with you, huh? But you think you are they are different. If you look at your usernames, I assume everybody has different usernames. Yes? But do you think there's a pattern there for your usernames? You probably, right? It's definitely not random. Agree? Because if it's random, you cannot remember them. <laughs> so you have to remember. You can add like you have the first name, last name, last name, first name, then the acronym, whatever. Then you press years or whatever. Okay. 
So there is a pattern there. Okay, so our work is to connect the information of the same user provided across different sites. So this is the work like uh, this uh, uh, Reza's thesis. Okay, he is about the information shared across sites provides the behavioral fingerprints. So the challenge is you have to make, you have to try to use their behavior pad knowledge the data, behavior data, you can observe to figure this out. So how do you do this? Uh, the system is called the Mobius. So we use uh, behavioral modeling and machine learning to, do, uh, to try to get at this, uh, to connect users. So quickly, behaviors. We have, oh, you cannot see it here. Huh? It's interesting, I don't know why. I'm so sorry. It's a secret. <laughs> no, it's not a secret. It's uh, I can see it here, but you cannot see it over there. I just noticed that it's a it's a human limitation. The first one, this is a human. Oh, it's it's back. <laughs> I think I should have blamed Albert. Okay, so he did something to my computer. Okay, so it's a human limitation. So that, what I just said, it's not possible for you to just generate random user names for you. So time and the memory limitation and knowledge limitation. The second one, exogenous factors. Exogenous factors, what are they? Typing patterns, you have your own typing patterns. For example, I'm influenced by my Chinese uh, uh, language training and spelling. That's what uh, uh, Reza told me. Basically, for Indians, they don't have certain letters in Indian language, and for uh, Farsi, they don't have certain. They don't use certain uh, these letters. Okay, so this comes kind of language patterns and typing patterns, then endogenous patterns. This is the personal attributes, traits, and the habits. So then, you say, how do you do that? Okay, the good news is this. The good news is we have to. Redundant behavior, okay? So your behavior will generate redundant information. You think you are very efficient, actually we are not. To be human, to err is a human, right? And also to be human, we are very much wasting a lot of our time and we do redundant things. Okay, so basically from the different uh, uh, behavior, we can capture features. You will be surprised how many features we can generate. Okay, actually, Reza can generate from, of course, the data he collected. Okay, so the key is different to be and different types of behaviors will generate information redundancy because of the, these the previous three factors. Okay, and we have feature sets like a feature set one, feature set two. We can get at these features. Then we do the learning framework. So what do you do at the end? Based on these, based on a person's username, actually Reza, he can generate, what do you think, how many, how many, how many features can he generate? What do you think? 10 usernames, 10 features. 20 features? He generated 400 features. Actually, you can generate even more. Okay, by looking into the background and all. Of course, not all features are relevant. And not more features, so there's a diminishing return of a lot of features. So you also have to evaluate all of these. So the key here is we can make him data. So he is success, he was successful to use the username to gather a lot of data.